Well, hey there, and welcome back. In this episode, what we'll look at are the specifics of how oxygen enters the blood and how carbon dioxide is released. We have to look a little bit at something called partial pressures. Now, when we think of pressure, one thing I want you to envision is pressure of all the gases in the atmosphere. Now, not all gases in the atmosphere are equal. Oxygen is about 20% of the atmosphere. So in this diagram, what we'll look at is a partial pressure for oxygen as defined in atmospheric air around sea level. These, so what you see about for its partial pressure um, measured in millimeters of mercury equivalents, but what we'll, we'll consider here, we'll just call them units. It's just easier. 159 units of pressure for partial pressure for oxygen is pretty high because of its, its um, prevalence in the atmosphere. Now, correspondingly, carbon dioxide is not nearly as high, doesn't make up as much of uh, the atmospheric gases, so its pressure is not nearly as high as oxygen's is. This really applies when we get into the alveolus, because if we inspire this air, uh, we have to look at the pressures of these gases compared to the pressures of those gases in our bloodstream. Now, you have to understand, as these gases enter our bloodstream, they do become uh, aff affiliated with our blood cells. Some of, some of these gases are dissolved in our tissues, but we'll get into that um, more specifically later. As you pass down, these partial pressures will change a little bit. You're going through a moist environment. Um, you're going past cells. So a little bit of oxygen is stripped away. You'll see it goes down to 105. So that clarifies that. You lose a little bit just due to natural diffusion. And carbon dioxide levels, they rise quite a bit because you're passing by tissues that release um, carbon dioxide. But nevertheless, the alveolar air has these units of equivalence. Now, what is that in comparison to tired blood? Well, come down here. When we look at the blood, once it's given up most of its oxygen, it only has 40 units of uh, partial pressure of oxygen versus 45 for carbon dioxide. So as that tired blood comes up um, pumped from the right side of the heart, the carbon dioxide levels, 45, is greater than 40 by 5 units. So this creates sort of a net pressure and it pushes carbon dioxide out. Sort of think of it almost as, as a difference in concentration. And that's exactly what causes this exodus. When we look at this entrance here, we have a much richer oxygenated environment in terms of partial pressure and it's a lot uh, it outstrips the pressure that's in the blood by 65 units so that's a tremendous um, net pressure inwards so as we go through the pulmonary capillaries this is why carbon dioxide leaves and oxygen enters now as we pass downstream a little bit to the left atrium what do we have at that point this is the the left atrium sends its blood to the left ventricle and we want to pump that um, highly oxygenated blood systemically to the rest of the body. About 100 units of oxygenation here and carbon dioxide sitting around 40. As we come to the um, systemic region, we come down here, you'll see that, I'll just have to zoom out a little bit, move up. The cells are pr producing waste, carbon dioxide waste. So that's the 45 units of uh, CO2. And that's going to pass into the blood and increase its concentration for CO2. As the oxygen passes out by diffusion, we'll end up back at the 40 units of oxygenation here. And we'll need another trip up to the capillaries. So you want to know these partial pressures. You want to know how this system works. Um, it's fairly critical. Now, when we look at oxygenation, those um, pressures more or less explain what's going on in the alveolar cluster here. Um, if you think in terms of percentages, uh, that's a very high percentage of oxygen passing through a thin, thin capillary wall. But the question is, what exactly is it adhering to now? What is it in a red blood cell, in the red blood cell membrane, that's there in such prevalence. Well, what's there is hemoglobin. And these are these quaternary, pro, um, well, enzymes 
enzymes or proteins that we talked about back in the enzyme unit. So oxygen can travel on hemoglobin molecules and the word hemoglobin, notice the prefix heme because there's heme groups in it or little iron compounds and uh, according to the rules of the periodic table, iron is an, a metal, oxygen is a non-metal, so they want to get together and make a strong bond, like an ionic bond, right, an association. So oxygen's also a little soluble in water, but only to a minor extent. So when we look at the red blood cell, we'll see most of the oxygen entering and forming an association with hemoglobin and some um, forming an association with the plasma and the fluid around it. So here's your hemoglobin molecule, pretty neat looking polypeptide with an iron core there. Um, there's a structure to memorize. But watch the oxygen molecules come in. So you'll see that this is it's very efficient because we've got millions and millions of these on the membrane of our red blood cells and you'll see that what will happen is you will have four molecules associate with hemoglobin and you notice it went a brighter color because when iron and oxygen combine sort of think of rust you get a sort of a brighter reddish sort of color which explains why our blood looks a lot more oxygenated pretty cool stuff so we call that structure when oxygen and hemoglobin come together we call it oxyhemoglobin Now, I'll just skip ahead here. There we go. Now what I want to look at is the dissociation. So when oxygen comes down to the tissues, um, goes past a systemic capillary wall, for example, you get near, let's say, your muscles and we're coming near a muscle cell here, what's going to happen is the oxyhemoglobin is going to give up its oxygen. Right? And partial pressure ex sort of more or less explained this. So oxyhemoglobin, let's just pause that. Oxyhemoglobin, which is HBO2, that's what we call it. It's, it's sort of interesting because you look at it and you say, well, what do you mean? It's, um, is that some kind of like, uh, is that like a chemical formula? No, it just means that hemoglobin is oxygenated but what will happen is that hemoglobin once uh, oxygen dissociates from it will associate with hydrogen ions and what we'll get is what's called deoxyhemoglobin so it's uh, a little bit more tired let's see here and uh, I think that was really the point I wanted to make there until we get back up here for a recharge with the uh, greater sort of atmospheric uh, partial pressure of oxygen. The system goes around and around. There we go. Now, when you look at hemoglobin, when it dissociates, um, hemoglobin and oxygen, it, it's really the uh, partial pressure offset that explains a lot of what's going on there. Um, Hemoglobin does its best job becoming oxygenated, the pulmonary, pulmonary capillaries. Uh, there's just lots of oxygen on hand, and you can see the, the graph rising. Um, and more or less, it's pretty straightforward. When you look at the uh, pH in the lungs, around the lungs, it tends to be a little higher, around pH 7.4. And that's a little bit better of an, of an environment for oxygen and hemoglobin to bind. But we're going to see a little difference in pH when we look at uh, what happens when we get near the muscles. Now the muscles, they're producing um, more waste products. You'll find that it's more acidic. And normal blood is around pH 7.4. But as you get around the muscles, you see sort of uh, a pH around um, 7.2. It's a little bit lower. And that difference is something they call the Bohr effect. And when you have a lower pH around 7.2, it's um, you'll find that the uh, oxygen is going to unload. And that's good because you want the oxygen to unload to the adjacent cells. And it's pretty well intended that way. Um, 
you can think of this dissociation um, when it becomes a bit more acidic it's better to get the oxygen off the hemoglobin molecule to the tissues that need it so when the pressure of carbon dioxide rises you could sort of think of this almost as a little invasion to the party um, as the pressure of carbon dioxide rises you'll find that the carbon dioxide will tend to associate and it's a little bit harder for oxygen to associate. Now this would happen in your tissues which are working harder and laboring and what will happen uh, is that carbon dioxide will hitch a ride onto your uh, hemoglobin molecule to head back as well there's also a, an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase that helps to take some of the carbon dioxide and to put it into a liquid form in the blood. And that's, uh, that's a neat one. We'll look at that uh, shortly. When we get back to the lung, there's an enzyme that takes carbon dioxide and makes it a liquid, puts it into your blood, but that same enzyme can make it a gas so that you can breathe it out. It's fabulous. It's called carbonic anhydrase. So there we go. Now, carbonic anhydrase, I'll just show you one quick shake here. So here's your red blood cell. And what I've done in this is I've taken a look at the hemoglobin molecule right here. So when the CO2 levels rise, hemoglobin itself, there's just, just think of it as oodles of these things in the membrane. And as you flow through the tissues, you're going to get that, like we referred to, that exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen. Now, carbonic anhydrase is a neat little enzyme. And you can see it kind of has two forms here. And what it does is carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the reaction of water and carbon dioxide and forms bicarbonate ions. Now, that can float around in blood plasma. So think of it as having your CO2, um, well, just kind of in liquid form. Now, when you get to the lungs, what's really neat about that is when you get to the lungs, oops, meant to click those lungs, carbonic anhydrase reverses the reaction and it takes that bicarbonate fixed CO2 and makes it possible for the CO2 to be exchanged at the lungs. So this is a very neat little trick. It's a great way. Uh, the body's got to get CO2 back to the, uh, the lungs to be released. It doesn't just do it with CO2 piggybacking on the red blood cells. It takes a whole bunch of CO2, turns it into bicarbonate ions, and then when it's time, reverses the reaction, and you breathe out that carbon dioxide. That's fairly impressive stuff. So... What I'll do, folks, I'll stop at this point because what we've looked at is kind of a totality of how we get oxygen and carbon dioxide in. We looked at the pressure differences, not only at the pulmonary level, but the systemic level. And then we looked at how the um, red blood cells release their payload of oxygen, and what pH does to that, sort of accelerates it. And then we looked at how carbon dioxide piggybacks on the red blood cells and carbonic anhydrase, a little enzyme in the red blood cells, helps to take CO2 and to put it in solution so that it can get back to the lungs and get out. So that's a little part you didn't know. Okay, folks, thanks for listening. And that's, uh, that's episode two.